Okay, I guess it's time to get started. So, coming to the end of the semester, next week we have class, and then in two weeks, same time, is our final. And I've been giving a lot of thought to the final um, and how to do it and how to make it appropriate for what we've uh, covered in class. And I have a lot of options. And I think what might be easiest for everybody and hopefully most effective from my standpoint is I will give you a final at the final exam time. I'll probably send it to everybody a couple hours early, maybe four o'clock, maybe five o'clock, and you'll have till midnight to do it and it's gonna be open note, okay? So you can either take it at home and email it back to me. Or you can come into class and do it here. I'll come in at five and sit in the room, answer questions if you have it. I'll stick around till nine. If you need more time, which hopefully you won't, I'm not gonna to try to make this thing brutal or anything. I just want it to be fair. Um, but I want to give you as much time as possible. I really want to see what you know. That's all I ever really hope for on exams is to try to gauge what you've learned, what you understand, what you're struggling with. Um, and that's all I'm going to try to do here. So I will try to give you a fair final. I'm not going to make it extra hard because it's open note. But we've gone through a lot of equations. And I could make you memorize them, which to me is stupid because <laughs> you're going to forget them two days later anyway, so what's the point? Um, or I could write them down on the test, which, you know, is a valid approach. I could do that, but along with the equations, I've given you some example problems, and a lot of times those are kind of useful for putting context to the equations. I mean, just having an equation it can be helpful, but to have a problem there that actually goes through it might be more helpful. I actually look at exams as being learning opportunities as well. Um, I hope you actually learn how to do these problems a little more effectively during the final. You don't have to stop learning before the final. You can actually learn during the final. Um, so I think I'm going to do it that way. So that you not only have the equations, but you have some of the example problems too. Um, I want to See if you've learned enough that you can apply some of the things that we learned in class. So that's my plan right now. So in two weeks, um, I'll send everybody the exam by email somewhere between four and five o'clock. I'll give you till midnight. If you want to take the class in the class or you want to take the test in the classroom, I'll be here at five. You can do it that way. Totally up to you. No need for a Zoom meeting since you are allowed to cheat by looking at your notes. The only thing that you can't do, can't call up your friend. No phone a friend, okay? None of that. You got to do this on your own. So honor system on that. I obviously can't monitor everybody's phone and uh, all other communication devices, but I expect you to honor that code. Do your own work. That's all I ask, okay? So if you have any questions about the exam between now and then, let me know. Um, I haven't decided if... Uh, it's cumulative, but I'm leaning towards just uh, having the test focus on all the material that we covered since the first exam. Some of it obviously depends on stuff we covered before the first exam. So in that sense, it's sort of cumulative, but there's plenty of material that we covered in the second half of the semester to give you more than enough to do on a final exam. So your grades at this point, um, the only things I've actually graded are two things. I grade your midterm and you all have passed your conversion test. So your grade at this point in time is basically whatever you got on the midterm plus half a letter grade. Um, so I'm in the process of grading your first homework. I should have that done this week. Everybody's doing well on that. That's gonna bump you up a little. Your second homework assignment is due next week. Get that in. If you get both of the homework assignments in, you pretty much have whatever grade you got on the first exam, plus a full letter grade. And then I'll add in the final. So that hopefully will let you know where you stand. Um, but if you have questions, let me know. Do you guys have any questions at this point? Okay, um, well, let's move on. So this groundwater class, if you ever pick up a textbook for groundwater geology, you will realize how little of the book we actually covered in this class, and that's pretty typical for undergraduate classes, because there are 
so many different equations to describe the subsurface movement of water under different conditions. And every slight modification to the conditions requires a tweak to the equation or a whole new set of equations. So what we're going to do today is look at what happens to the water table in a water table aquifer, an unconfined aquifer, when we pump it. And if you return back to your intro to environmental course or your intro to geology course, we talked a lot about cones of depression, a local lowering of the water table that occurs when pumping happens. That's what we're gonna to do today, is we're gonna actually calculate how big the cone of depression is for a given set of conditions. How much are they pumping? How thick is the aquifer? What's the aquifer made of? Things like that. So we can see how the cone of depression is shaped, how extensive it is, things like that. So, but I will leave you with this, and it's basically, let's see. Oh man, I don't know what happened to my first part. Hang on, I'm already having failure. So let me just go with this. So over the past 100 years or so, equations describing the flow of water to wells and have been developed for a variety of scenarios. For example, we have equations that describe the flow of water in water table aquifers, unconfined aquifers. And within, let's say, that group of equations, we have lots of variations to these equations. We have equations that take into account whether the groundwater is being recharged or not. So we have one set of equations that might deal with a water table aquifer that has recharge. But then there'll be a different equation that will deal with a water table aquifer that isn't getting any recharge. And there'll be slightly different equations. And if you're kind of a groundwater academic geologist, you probably just focus on one of these things and start developing equations that get better and better and better at actually mimicking what's going on in the subsurface. And yet there's another group of equations for confined aquifers that are different than the equations for the water table aquifers. And within that group, we have confined aquifers that can be recharged. You'll see these referred to in textbooks as leaky confined aquifers. They're confined, but they actually recharge slowly as water just barely moves around in the confining layer, but it can be enough that it has to be accounted for. And then we have other equations that deal with confined aquifers that don't get recharged. And then if you really want to get complicated, there's a whole set of other equations that deal with water flowing through fractures. And these first two, 
This is mostly flow through pores. And these equations, for the most part, are based on Darcy's law. But fracture flow is a completely different beast on its own. So there'd be different equations for that. And obviously, in a class like this, we don't have time to go through 20, 30, 40 different equations for all the different possibilities that come up. And that's not my goal for this class anyway. What I want to do is maybe just pick out one equation. We'll work through it, see how it goes. And if you're ever out doing this in the real world, you can look at the new equations. And because you've had some experience with others, you should be able to adapt to it. So that's my only hope here. I can't teach this all to you in a semester. Nobody can. You'd have to take multiple courses on this to get all of the background you would need to deal with all the different types of scenarios that we have for groundwater. And then there's even a fourth set of equations um, that we're not going to go through in here, and they're called slug tests. And these are kind of field experiments that we use to define quantities like hydraulic conductivity of rocks. So these are to help define variables related to the geology. I'm just going to digress a little bit on this, show you what I mean by a slug test. So let's make a well. And let's say here's the water table right here. So this is the unsaturated zone, and this is the saturated zone. And here is the level of water in your well right there. And what you do for a slug test is you dump a bunch of water into your well. Just the opposite of what you normally do to a well. Normally in a well, you pump water out of the ground. With a slug test, what you do is you put a whole bunch of water in there, and you fill the well up. And what's going to happen is that that water then is going to leak into the unsaturated zone. And over time, this water level here will drop. Say from this level here back down as water leaks into the aquifer and based on how fast it leaks in that tells you something about the porosity the permeability and so on so it's a way of gauging some variables that you can then use to more accurately calculate what's going to happen to your well when you actually pump water out of it so those are slug tests so they're pretty common in groundwater as well my whole point for this little digression is that there are many, and I mean many, quantitative approaches to dealing with groundwater. And many of these quantitative approaches are really complex mathematically. Anyway, these can, this can be very difficult math. They all involve some pretty hairy derivations. And the reason they're so complex is that flow through porous medium 
is complicated. Because it depends on the fluid properties. Here we're dealing mostly with fresh water. But if you get into coastal regions where lots of people live, you can get saltwater intrusion, has slightly different density, has slightly different viscosity. So that can complicate things greatly. And really what makes it quite difficult is that it depends on the rock properties. Stuff's flowing through tiny little cracks and crevices in rocks. And these rocks vary from place to place. And even within a sandstone, it can vary. And that makes finding a mathematical way of estimating what goes on in the ground pretty tough. And finally, and this is really what makes the math awful, for most of these equations is that these are three-dimensional problems. And three-dimensional mathematics are really complicated. So the bottom line is, for somebody like me who's trying to teach a class that's mostly undergraduates, is what do I cover? What's important? Knowing that I only have a semester, you know, what, what do I actually do with this? So, what most of us have decided, and I've certainly decided, is that um, we will not derive these equations in class. What I really want is a more practical approach, I guess. The derivations, that's for a pure graduate course on this as far as I'm concerned. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the final equations. We're just gonna apply this stuff, okay? Give you some practice, taking some math and coming up with some answers that folks might find useful with respect to pumping wells. So we're gonna use final equations without really going into the hairy derivations. And for this class today, we're gonna to focus on water table aquifers. So we're gonna have an unsaturated zone above, saturated zone below the water table. We're gonna stick a well into it and we're gonna start pumping it. And then we're gonna see how big the cone of depression is based on the pumping rate. So, with that in mind, let's move forward. So there's a couple of important quantities that we're gonna use in the equations today. I'm gonna to list them, show the math, and try to give you a simple explanation as to what they really are physically. The first one is something called specific storage. Big S with a little s. I'm just gonna put the equation here for it. And it actually brings together a lot of the different variables that we have used so far to date. 
Now you've seen all of these variables, variables before, but I'm going to put the units and kind of what they are. Okay, so this quantity, specific storage. We'll talk about this a little more in a minute, but it really has to do with how much water can be stored in an aquifer. How much is available to be pumped out. Because if you think about it, let's say you have an aquifer that just doesn't have a lot of water in it, and you start pumping it. Well, your Kona depression is going to get big really fast, right? It's just going to suck what little water is there out, and the whole thing's going to—the whole area is going to lower in terms of the water table very rapidly. So this is just sort of a measure of how much water is in your aquifer. So it has to do with the porosity, whether water can be compressed. Water doesn't compress very well, but it compresses a tiny amount, so that allows you to get a little more water into your aquifer. So what I'd like you to do is don't plug in any numbers for this, just plug in the units, okay? Kilograms per meter cubed, meters per second squared, meters squared per Newton, so on. And tell me what the unit is for specific storage. Just take a minute and see if you can figure out what the unit would be once you start crossing out all of these. 
Okay, so if you kind of followed through with all this, it's not super straightforward. You have to actually put the real units in for Newtons, which is right here. And then since Newton is on the bottom, you multiply by the inverse. And at the end, you're left with one over meters, which is a inverse length, one over length, okay? That's the final unit. It'll be per meter, something per meter. Okay, that's specific storage. Hopefully it'll make a little more sense here in a second when we talk about the second quantity, which is something called storativity. S, and it equals the specific storage times B, where B is the aquifer thickness. And we measure aquifer thickness in meters. What was our unit for specific storage? It was one over meter from the previous page. Now we're multiplying it by B, the thickness of the aquifer. They cancel out and you're left with another dimensionless number. So here's kind of the bottom line, so sort of a simple explanation of what's going on here. So the storativity is a dimensionless number. that describes an aquifer's ability to hold water. Obviously a thicker aquifer, all things being equal, is gonna be able to hold more water than a thin one. An aquifer that has a greater porosity, if you go back to the specific storage definition, will be able to hold more water than one that has a low porosity. Yeah? I'm so sorry. I must have missed it. Uh, what was the, um, the definition for specific storage? Specific storage, it's really similar to this. It's, it's a quantity that reflects how much water an aquifer can store. And this goes one step beyond by accounting for the thickness. Okay. So everything that's in S sub S reflects an aquifer's ability to hold water. And that's just based on the fluid properties and the rock properties. The second term, storativity, then figures out how big is your aquifer. If it's a really thick aquifer, it can hold more water than a thin one. So basically these two equations sort of taken in tandem give you the aquifer thickness, thicker aquifer, more water, compressibility of both the water and the rock. The more compressible or flexible it is, the more water you can squeeze into it. The porosity, the more pore space you have, the more water you can squeeze into it. Okay, so it's just, you can just think of these equations, they work in tandem and they are an estimate of how much water an aquifer can hold. And that's important when we pump it because aquifers that hold a lot of water are able to send water to the well. You can think of it that way. If an aquifer doesn't have much water in it and you start pumping it fast, it's just gonna pump it dry really, really quickly.
So let's use these and hopefully it will be even more clear after that. So let's get some basic assumptions going here. Okay, first assumption. The aquifer is bounded on the bottom by a confining layer. It's not a confined aquifer. In this case, the confining layer is underneath. It, think of it this way, it keeps your aquifer from losing water to deeper depths. So it's gonna keep your water in your aquifer and it's gonna keep it from flowing deeper. Now, if this isn't the case where you're pumping, then you would have to use a different set of equations. So the aquifer is bounded on the bottom by a confining layer. Again, if this isn't the case, you have to look up a different definition. But for today's example, we're going to assume there's a confining layer at the base of your aquifer. One thing else that that first assumption does is it means that your aquifer has a finite thickness. It's not unlimited in terms of how much water it can store. It's just so thick. It's a sandstone that's 20 feet thick, 30 feet thick, 100 feet thick, whatever the case may be. It's not going to lose water to deeper depths. The water's just sort of in there for now, okay? We're going to assume all rock layers are horizontal. If they aren't, if they're severely tilted, you got to use different equations. But we're going to use the simplest one for today. Potentiometric surface, the height of the water table, is not changing prior to pumping. It's in sort of a state of equilibrium. If it's dropping down for some reason, maybe somebody somewhere else is pumping, then you have to use a different equation. You're going to assume you have a simple aquifer in terms of its geology. The aquifer is homogeneous. And isotropic. We discussed isotropic a few class periods ago. It basically means that water flows the same in every direction. It flows the same speed if it's flowing left to right, right to left north to south, south to north, east to west, up and down. That's real common for sandstones and limestones. If you have things like shales and other rocks that have sort of a uh, stratigraphy inside of it, then water may move in one direction easier than the other. That's called anisotropic flow. And if that's the case, guess what? You have to use a different equation. Another assumption is that all flow is radial. Remember, this is a three-dimensional problem towards the well. In other words, once you start pumping it, it's going to suck water in from every direction equally. This equation is based on Darcy's Law, so you have to make sure Darcy's Law is valid. We talked about how to do that last class using the Reynolds number. I forgot what number I'm on, so I'm going to guess. <laughs> I don't know if it's eight, seven, nine. 
we're going to assume the groundwater itself has a constant density and gravity. Density and viscosity, excuse me. That's usually a pretty safe assumption. Unless you're in a coastline area with saline water coming in, then you have to adjust your equations. Now, since this is a well that people are going to use for water, it's a little different in its construction than the piezometers we've talked about so far. So far, we've talked about wells being piezometers, which is basically just a piece of PVC with an opening at the bottom. When you make a well for people to drink from, you put lots of holes in it. And in fact, what you do is you pretty much screen that entire length of well that's going to encounter the groundwater. So in this case, we're going to assume that the well is screened. Through the entire thickness. Of the aquifer. So if these are the assumptions that kind of boils us down to a handful of equations that we could apply. So what we are left with is that we now can use different equations, different quantitative approaches. for different subsurface scenarios. And I'll give you an example of this here. All right, let's do a problem. Case one. All right, so let's have a completely confined aquifer. We're now going to add a confining layer at the top as well. We're going to sandwich this thing between two confining layers. Remember, in our first set of assumptions, there's a confining layer at the bottom. For this case, we're going to put a confining layer on the top. but we have no ability to recharge it on a short time scale. I mean, sure, give it a million years, it'll probably recharge, but we're gonna deal with human time scale here. So, a way for new water to enter the system. So we have a couple of additional assumptions to deal with. As I said before, the aquifer is also confined on the top. sandwiched between two confining layers. We said there's no recharge that occurs during the pumping. And finally, we're going to pump at a constant rate. So we're just going to pump continually. We're just going to keep sucking water out of this at a certain amount. 
Now, if you're not doing that, if you're pumping and then you're not pumping and then you're pumping and then you're not pumping, you have to use a different equation. So that's why there's literally hundreds of groundwater equations based on all these different scenarios. But I'm going to give you one that's, sadly, this is one of the simplest ones. And it's not super simple, okay? They just keep getting worse after this. So let's start with this. All right, so let's sort of draw this. All right, I'm going to draw kind of what's going on here. So we're going to have a confining layer above, and we're going to have a confining layer below, and this is going to be our aquifer. And what's going to happen is we are going to remove water at a constant rate. We're going to start pumping this. And what will happen is we're going to make a cone of depression. The water's going to draw down most quickly right near the well. As you get far and far away, you won't draw down as much as all, but it gives this cone shape in three dimensions. So let's define a few quantities. So this level right here is the total head or water level prior to pumping. Basically right at the top of the aquifer. This right here, B is the aquifer thickness. Now for this equation, this is going to be our point of interest. We're going to be a little bit away from our well. And we want to know how is the pumping of the well going to affect the level of the water table beneath me? Okay, so we're at this point right here, this point of interest. And the well that's off to the right here is going to start pumping and it's going to lower the water table beneath where you're interested. Okay. Maybe that's two miles away. Maybe that's your property and the well is your neighbor's and you want to know, Hey, my neighbor's pumping a lot of water. How's that going to affect my water table? We're going to be able to figure that out with this equation. Okay. So at this point of interest right here, This level right on top, well, let me draw this a little better. This level right here is just H. This is the total head or the water table level. At the point of interest. 
this little bit right here that's dropped. That's what we call the drawdown. That's how much the water table has lowered as a result of the cone of depression caused by pumping. And it's basically your total head prior to pumping minus your head level after pumping. And then this right here, from there to there, R, R is the radius or distance from the well. So what this equation does is it tells us how much the water table lowers at some distance r from a well. Okay, that's what we're going to do here. All right, so let's take a couple minute break and then we'll, I'll give you the equation, we'll walk through it. It's not that difficult, but just remember that anytime you change assumptions, you have to change the equation. So I'm gonna try to give you a little cleaner diagram here in a second and we'll uh, put up the equation and we'll go from there. So take a, take a 10 minute break and let me get this next part ready and we'll go through it.